coming to today's event at this year's coronavirus affected Swindon Festival of Literature, as a result of which it's become a virtual online festival. Thanks everyone for joining us. We do hope that everything is well where you are. We're both pleased and grateful that human ingenuity, cutting edge science and digital technology make it possible for this show to go on, or at least to go on online. And this event is being recorded in the company of and presented in association with members of the Swindon Philosophical Society. Today's guest author has written a book um, with, dare I say it, a nicely provocative and slightly challenging title, at least to an Englishman. Its title is The French Art of Not Trying Too Hard. Here it is, The French Art of Not Trying Too Hard. But that is perfect for an event with a philosophical society, if only because the book's author is also a philosopher, lecturer at the Paris Philharmonie, prize-winning novelist and researcher into ambition and creativity. Please join me in giving a Swindon Festival of Literature and Swindon Philosophical Society welcome to our guest author tonight, Olivier Pouillol. Um, welcome, Thank you. Olivier. Thank you very much for your applause and, and welcome. Well, we're very pleased that you're able to take part in our festival, at least only online. But it's a pity we can't see you live here in Swindon, because Swindon is lovely in spring. Maybe it compares even with Paris in the spring. And by the way, have you ever been to Swindon? Uh, well, I'm, I plan to, to come as soon as uh, the lockdown in Paris is over, you know? I used to live in London when I was 16 years old. I was attending the, the French Lycée in South Kensington. And, uh, but I was too busy um, uh, working and uh, studying and uh, losing my youth reading, you know? So I didn't come to Swindon, but I hope to, to come maybe, maybe next year. Uh, maybe giving a talk at the Swindon Philosophical Society. Okay, we better get to the book. That's what we're here for the French art of not trying too hard. And with apologies to you, Olivier, uh, having to speak to us in English, because most of us have not tried hard enough to learn French, but we're very grateful that you're speaking to us in English. Some of the questions in hand. Is it possible to succeed more when you renounce perfectionism and generally loosen up a little? Could we all benefit from a bit more irreverence and lighter touches. Is there any truth in the notion that are made out of wasted time, daydreaming, and thinking about nothing at all? You raised some great questions, Olivier. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, well, the, the book was born from um, too much work. Uh, I mean, um, I, I was at the time in my life where uh, I was um, on, raising kids. And uh, when you are raising children, you are kind of always tired, you know? So you have, uh, don't have a lot of time to think or, or to read or to, to work. I mean, to work, to do something you enjoy, um, even if children are enjoyable. So I came to think of all the hours I had lost uh, trying to pursue goals uh, with um, much effort and uh, not, uh, not much result. So I decided to start an inquiry, um, reading uh, testimonies from athletes, um, philosophers, writers, um, people who managed to, to do something worthwhile. And um, I came to the conclusion that it was not the question of uh, the hours you had put in uh, doing something. It was the, the style of these hours to start with. So everything started with um, two books I read in English, in fact. So the first one, because I, I love reading in English, it gives me the illusion that I can uh, be, I mean, fluent or maybe you are freer when you think in a different language uh, than your maternal uh, tongue. So I, I read 
uh, a book by Malcolm Gladwell. I guess he, all of you know him. Uh, this guy is writing nonfiction in France. It doesn't really exist as a as a genre, you know. But I enjoy it a lot because it's between journalism and um, and philosophy. It's a, a journalist uh, who decides to take an idea as seriously as possible and to make an inquiry about it. So I, I love the, the, this, this type of inquiry. And I, I read a book uh, called Outliers. And it was in that book talking about um, amazingly successful people like the Beatles or like Bill Gates. And he came to the conclusion um, that there was a kind of rule unsaid that um, uh, universal it called he called it the 10,000 hours rule and that rule goes like that uh, if you spend 10,000 hours working on anything you'll um, well you'll end up mastering the the task you know or, or the skill uh, but 10,000 hours, not in a row, you know, you, can, you can't work 24 hours a day. So he, in the end, 10,000 hours, it ends up, um, well, sums up to 10 years of uh, work uh, with a few hours a day for five days a week, uh, with uh, two weeks of resting, uh, of rest uh, or pause for a year, in a year. And... Um, if tennis, chess, uh, soccer, uh, whatever, um, you, you in golf, you no, know, you're supposed to end up not as a champion, but like an, an expert. And um, that was weird to me because um, I kept trying, for example, playing the piano, and the number of hours I, I spent didn't make me really better, or there was no 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 sign of. Um, uh, excellence and in other um, uh, tasks um, I was spending fewer hours and uh, uh, I was better so I thought okay maybe it's not the question of time and then I read this other book by David Epstein uh, called The Sports Gene and uh, came to a different conclusion because he said if you if you really um, check how many hours um, uh, champions spent training uh, you 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 understand that they didn't spend 10,000 hours some of them spent 3,000 some of them 2,000 and some of them um, reached excellence without any effort because their body was made for uh, the effort and uh, he takes as an example there's this uh, uh, it's a race for dogs in fact you know <laughs> Uh, and and he interviewed a trainer for dogs. It's a for a very difficult race in the snow. In the, no, I don't know where it is uh, anymore. But they spend like three months or three weeks. Uh, it's called uh, Idita Road, something like that. And he said, "Okay, you can't train a dog uh, to to be a champion." He has it in, in his blood or he doesn't have it. So you can try, you, you can stall them, you can you know, use a negative, um, uh, I don't know how you said, it, but it's, good. it's in fact, if, you, if the dog manages to do something, you um, uh, get rid of the punishment, you know? It's called negative uh, training, something like that. So, he said everything you you can use to to push the dog forward is useless you know some dogs like working others don't and i, I came to think to myself it reminds me when i tried to to study math at a very high level because i was a good student you know so i tried to do math because uh, at that time it was kind of uh, sexy no, not sexy but it was supposed to be um, it was supposed to open all the doors. So I tried to push on that door, but uh, in the school where uh, the school I was attending, the problem was it was a very good school and everybody used to be a very good student, but some of them were better than me. Well, most of them were better than me in mass. Suddenly I, wa I was not the first in the class. I was like the last. And I didn't understand how that happened because I was trying so hard. 
But some people just, uh, they could see the solutions. Me had to, to strive, you know? And uh, when I, um, I considered the gap between us, I said, okay, let's go back to what was easier for me. And that was easier for me to, to write because I enjoyed reading. And uh, me as a dog, you know, I was a dog made for reading. So I, I don't know if I was made for writing, but I, I enjoyed when I was 10 years old, I enjoyed reading one book a day. And sometimes I would read it twice. And sometimes just for the fun of it, three times, you know, and nobody was pushing me. And at, at some point, my parents uh, were preventing me from reading. And uh, I think I got my glasses from reading in the dark, uh, you know, in my bed, <laughs> hidden from my parents, because I enjoyed it so much. It was like candy to me. So uh, when I thought about these experiences, uh, okay, maybe in some, in some realms, we should not strive. Maybe it's useless to make an effort when you're not made for something, you know? Um, I'm not saying that you have to get rid of the notion of effort, but maybe you have to disconnect it in your mind um, from the notion of success, you know? It's not because you make an effort that you will end up uh, with success. Uh, so I think this is a moral judgment we, we are raised with that we have, uh, we call it meritocracy in France, you know, uh, you have to deserve, uh, you have to earn it. So you have uh, in school, for example, uh, when a teacher writes as a comment, uh, good effort, <laughs> that means you're a failure, you know? When you failed, people tell you, you made an effort. So on a moral level, you are impeccable. You are a nice person. But well, you failed, so what's the point? Maybe you, sh you should strive doing even better what you already enjoy. So you could say that maybe if you enjoy nothing, what's the, you know, maybe there's a problem and that's, but maybe that's the problem of school, you know? If you force children into things they don't like, how do you want them to achieve any kind of success? And this is where the book was born from, you know? So, um, um, to start with uh, just a general remark on the title, you could, I did, get rid of the adjective French in it, you know? It's not about the French art of not trying too, too hard. It's just a marketing, uh, <laughs> um, you know, um, thing I had to, well, I regret it now. So for the, for the pocketbook version, we got rid in France, is going to be out next week we got rid of the French adjective in it because it's about uh, finding universal uh, tips of, or methods about the, the spiritual level, you know, or how the mind works, how the heart works, how a human being works. So we got rid of the French thing because it was not essential, uh, but there are many uh, French philosophers in it because maybe those are the ones I understand with uh, with um, more ease, no, if I, if I can say like that. Please, uh, as you say, forgive my French. Um, uh, I'm kind of um, striving, but I hope it's, it's not too uncomfortable for you to listen to. Uh, so is, was it enough for a start, Matt, or do you need uh, more? I can hear you, your mic is cut. I can ask you a question if you like one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and the others might uh, be, be ready to join. Um, <clears throat> on page 33, you say this. I rejected the suffering that comes from pursuing a path to which one is not suited. Effort against the grain is exhausting. It's a sign of courage and of abnegation, but above all, it's a sign of self-deprivation. A negative virtue is not without value, but in the end, someone who doesn't like, someone who doesn't like what they do will never go as far as someone who enjoys what they do. And eight out of the 10 people you thank, and you thank quite a few people, 
<laughs> are people with you with whom you've done something that you've enjoyed. So you haven't said, I thank my severe editor who cut out all my semicolons or anything like that. You say, I thank so-and-so who I went fishing with. I thank so-and-so who I played tennis with. I thank so-and-so who I had a great bottle of wine with. Um, so you seem to be an Epicurean, pleasure-seeking, lifelong learner. I mean, is, is, is that the right way? I, I, I'm not suggesting it's not right to drink bottles of wine or anything like that, but should one, is it, is it good advice for a parent to say to a child, only do the things you like? Well, as a parent, I don't say that to my children, but um, I'm trying to show them that you can enjoy working to start with. And I have the, the, the pleasure to enjoy what I'm doing, you know, have a, a life of, um, of pleasure because I enjoy, I enjoy working. So I'm not saying that pleasure is the opposite of work. I say the opposite. I say if you, if you, if you like your work, you, you enjoy working and it's possible. In fact, we are maybe in times where work and pleasure are supposed to be opposites. And it's the case in many people's lives because we have to make a living. So um, we have to work uh, in order to make a living. And a big part of this work is not agreeable. Uh, maybe we didn't choose it. I'm not in that case, you know. Uh, so uh, my children, when they see me working, they don't understand what my work is because I'm, for example, writing scripts. That means I have to watch series all day long <laughs> or movies, but I watch them with them and we watch them in English with French subtitles to start with, then with English subtitles, then with no subtitles. And uh, by mixing uh, correctly uh, the right amount of pleasure and of work, you understand there are different styles of satisfactions. And um, the, the longer ones are, are the best or are the better ones. So, you know, when you talk about Epicure, uh, if you take a close look at Epicure, it was not somebody who was going, it was not a pig because uh, people used to talk about Epicureans as pigs, you not know, just enjoying uh, cheap pleasure and easy an easy life. That was not the case. Epicure said that if you want to have the highest pleasure, you have to be able to, um, to enjoy a meal made of uh, maybe a piece of bread and an olive, you know? So, um, um, yes, I'm, I'm Epicurean, but I, I had to learn to be it because my first um, way of uh, living was hard work, uh, constant work, and I was not able when I was young to enjoy a glass of wine or to, uh, um, I enjoyed reading, you know, but that was not enough to to give you a taste of what life is about. So I had to devise a method not to go against my my grain, as, as you said, and my grain at that time was uh, to strive, you know, because because I enjoy working. So if you work too much, if you, in fact, you know what, my answer is just, I, I wrote this book close to the sea in Greece because I enjoy swimming. But when I was younger, I hated swimming because I was forced to learn how to swim, and I remember swimming as drowning, like a constant drowning, and. When you go to the swimming pool with your class, it's like a punishment. It's it's cold and uh, you have all these people screaming and you have to, you know. And uh, I came to like swimming when I was not forced uh, do, to, to, to do it anymore. I enjoyed swimming because it suddenly my imagination uh, invested the ocean like a place for freedom. And uh, I, I enjoyed then skin diving. Now, and now to tell you the truth, I'm able to go to uh, Italy, to the deepest uh, swimming pool in, uh, in Europe, close to Venice. It's 40 meter uh, deep. And uh, I enjoy being there at six in the morning, uh, training with uh, some champion because now I like swimming and skin diving so much. It's a pleasure because I, I do it by myself, you know? So 
I think children, if in school they are forced to do something, they'll, they, they can master a skill, but they'll never enjoy it. And the, and the real work happens when you work alone, when you enjoy it by yourself, you know? uh, when you feel the, the, the pleasure of reading, for example, Balzac, when it was a mandatory reading in school, I skipped it. You know, I pretended I knew it. I read summaries and, uh, okay. And when I was 30 years old, I started reading Balzac and it was so beautiful because there was freedom in it, you know? And I read uh, Balzac as a pleasure because nobody told me what, what to do. So the problem of school is that you have to force youngsters to enjoy things they might enjoy later. So, well, it's a difficult equation, you know? Okay, um, I'll ask one more question. This will give, ah, we've got a question from the floor. This is good, John Little. Hi, uh, thanks very much for that, Olivier. Um, you mentioned about the comment, works hard being a very negative comment. And I think back to my school days and university days, and I think of the story of Stephen Hawking. The important thing about Stephen Hawking wasn't that he was brilliant, but he did it without effort. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that's <laughs> And I was thinking, if there was an English version of this book, it would be the English art of not being seen to try very hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. You have to pretend it's effortless. Uh, but it's, it, you know what? It's part of the politeness um, of um, what the society is about. You have to pretend you're not putting a lot of effort in a in your relationship with others. Even if you are very shy, you have, you are to, you have to pretend you're not. Um, but as of Stephen Hawking, um, or the, the notion of, uh, of effort, in, in fact, I think there are some realms where you have to make an effort. Um, um, for example, if you learn the language, uh, you have to make an effort at the beginning and it becomes easier and easier because you transform the effort into a habit. And it's the same if you want to, to, to learn how to, to swim in the cold water or in the very hot water. At the beginning, it's um, suffering. So if you transform it into a habit, then it becomes effortless. So maybe that's the you know, um, constant work as has got a result for sure. You transform the effort into a habit, so you don't have to think about what you're gonna do next. You do it without thinking about it, and it's uh, effortless to make an effort. You know, it's weird, but uh, it's like that. Thank you, Olivier. Um, anyone else with a point or a question? Um, the the book is uh, um, Olivier refers to French writers in particular, but also others, many others. It's a very literary book. Uh, Simone Weil comes up quite a bit. Um, uh, um, uh, um, Flaubert, um, uh, Sartre, and so on. But he also uses as examples people who do physical things, not mental things. He talks quite a bit about Zidane Zidane, the footballer. He talks a lot about Philippe Petit, the uh, the uh, highline oh, walker, walker. Yeah. The, the, the trapeze, who went between the, the Twin Towers when they existed. Um, and it occurred to me as I was reading that sometimes, you know, you said how balletic Zidane was. And I sometimes I thought, well, this is talent, isn't it? Um, and it's not a question of trying hard or not trying hard. You know, you've mentioned Stephen Hawking. If somebody is talented, um, neither one thing nor the other applies. Uh, they can do it. Yeah, right. But the the style, you know, it's interesting, the example of Zidane, because um, everybody sees the uh, effortless ballet dancer. Um, but, you know, when he was young, his mother, he, he was living in, the, in Marseille, in the, in the suburbs, and the his mother wanted to always keep an eye on him, you know? So she allowed him to play soccer, but at one condition, um, she had to be able to see him from her kitchen through the window, you know? So he had to play in a very narrow space. 
And this is where he developed his way of playing in small spaces. And then nobody knows that, but even myself, I, I learned it after I'd written the books. You know, it was kind of the late information. But um, I learned that uh, Zidane um, learned um, martial arts and uh, judo uh, for many years before playing soccer. And if you watch the way he always, um, I mean, he's got, he's turning his back on his opponent when the opponent tries to tackle him and he's using the opponent as a you know a way of of turning and in fact he learned that in judo so the interesting part is um this is a, another book by david epstein but i read it after i wrote my book too it's called range and uh, he says you know in the in modern times, we tend to specialize and to tell our children to specialize as soon, as early as possible in life. And he calls it the um, Tiger Woods syndrome, something like that, you know, because uh, at six months, uh, when he was six months old, he was already <laughs> playing golf, something like that. And this is the only thing he did. Uh, and he became very good at it. And then he, he get, gives another example another champion, another style. He talks about Roger Federer. And he says it's very different because Federer specialized very late. You know? uh, he practiced and he keeps practicing different sports. And uh, when, you are, when you have a wide range, hence the title of uh, David Epstein's book, when you have a wide, wide range of skills, in fact, you create something new because you build bridges between your different skills. Uh, so the point is not saying that if you are good at something, keep doing it because it's going to be easy, easy for you. It's not that because that would be poor. I know there's, there's no content in that. It's more um, be curious, you know, uh, and uh, have a sense of rhythm. This is what I wanted to tell you. I wrote this book close to the sea. And when you watch the sea, and this is something that Simon Weil, uh, who died in London, by the way, in 1943 or 1944, I don't remember the exact date during World War II. She says, uh, and she was saying that before knowing that Hitler uh, would lose the war, you know. Uh, and she said, if you watch the sea, if you watch a wave, it is going to go maybe very high, but at some point is going to, uh, how you call that, uh, to get down again. You no, know? if you have a up, you're gonna have a down, and if you have a down, you're gonna have a up, and you have to think of attention because attention is your tool as a mind to understand and to work. You have to think about attention as um, a rhythm, and he, uh, the philosopher Alain, who was the master of um, Simon Weil, used to say, "Attention beats." as a pulse. And if you understand that, if you keep it in mind, you know you won't be able to listen to somebody speaking two hours in a row. And this is why we have to keep this lecture not too long and we have to um, go back and forth, questions, answers, and maybe movie clips and maybe a glass of something, you know, uh, to, uh, to build a rhythm. Because if you build a rhythm, then you have a high point of attention, but you know you won't be able to stay there as a plateau, you know? It's going to go down. So what are you going to do when, when it's going to go down? You have to have a way to wait. You can't force a wave back. You have to wait for it, you know? And uh, if we learn to do that with ourselves, um, this is the only lesson I learned uh, writing my book. All the people who made great discoveries, mathematicians, or all the athletes who were very good, at some point, they know how to get rid of tension. No, they don't strive after the goal all the time. It's, uh, um, it's like a thunderbolt, you know? You have to build it. So first you have clouds and clouds and clouds, and suddenly you have one thunderbolt, like electricity. And then you have rest, you know, and then it builds, uh, tension builds again, and then another thunderbolt, you know. And I think this is really the, um, the only chapter you should read in my book. It's the one called um, The Secret Laws of Attention. And uh, I, um, I concentrated in that chapter all the findings I made by uh, inquiring around me and in books and you know from the fleets from thinkers the 
the, the wisdom uh, about the rhythm of attention. Um, in fact, you say books are made out of wasted time, daydreaming and thinking about nothing. And um, uh, um, uh, who's that English writer who wrote uh, huh, Faber and Faber? Um, oh, she's escaped my mind now. Who wrote Orla Orlando? Who wrote the waves? Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Virginia Woolf, who was very diligent, wrote a lot by hand and so on. She would say, don't force it. If the writing isn't going, go out and pick petals from a rose flower. Do something else, whatever you're looking for. Um, but actually, writing work, after you've answered this, we'll come to Paul with his question. Um, so, Writing does, in the end, still require certain discipline, doesn't it, Olivia? Yeah, but if you talk about Virginia Woolf, she said the most important thing is to have a room, you know, a place to work and a habit to build. And um, I love Roald Dahl. I don't know if I spell it or pronounce it well. You know, this, uh, the, the famous writer of um, um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. How do you say it? Roald? Dal, Dal. Dal, yeah. Yeah. He, he was a man of habit, and uh, even Bukowski was, you know. At some point, you have to sit at your table, or, or some people are writing as they walk, but you have to, to build uh, or to make an appointment or a rendezvous, if it's a love story, with your uh, muse, you know. Uh, so work is a question of habit, for sure. And uh, the quote you, you chose in my book was from François Sagan. And François Sagan, who was supposed to be very gifted because she wrote this uh, book, Bonjour Tristesse, Hello Sadness. I don't know how it's translated into English. But she was very young when she was successful. And, and she had this um, um, style of... Um, and sophisticated uh, style of letting things go, you know, she laissez faire kind of uh, natural talent. But at the same time, uh, she used to work like 48 hours in a row. Uh, she would spend her nights writing because that was a time where she was not disturbed by phone calls or people. So, for example, she couldn't write in a cafe because she was too much distracted by other people. And for Hemingway, that was the opposite. He had to write in a cafe when he was in Paris. Uh, and not only because that was a place where he could um, order whiskey or, or get some warmth. You know, uh, um, he had to sit at the table and to steal something from the world around. And in fact, that's another lesson in the book. It's impossible to start something. It's very difficult. You have to be a god if you want to start something. But it's pretty easy to continue, you know? Um, to go on to doing something, maybe to, to do it better, or maybe um, to continue the work of somebody else. And that's um, a tip I took from Stendhal. He said, as he was unable to, to start anything, he would start his day of work by reading somebody else's uh, article, you know, uh, commenting somebody else's work, um, correcting somebody else's sentence, and this is a way to to start by just continuing, you know. And uh, at the beginning of the book, um, uh, I give the this idea I took from the philosopher Alain, and he, he says, "Okay, this is my philosophy of action, and it works. It's made of two words." but don't mix them. The first word is continue. And the second is start. And he says the order makes the idea because you, it's impossible to start something. It's easier to continue a conversation, for example, than to start it, you know? So if you know that, you can start things without thinking about them because the, the important thing is to continue them. No? So it's not the first sentence you're going to write on your white page that's going to count. It's uh, just the uh, impetus. You, know? you have to go on. And then at the end of the day, maybe the first sentence, you can get rid of it. It's like a scaffolding. You know? 
uh, a starter. And um, the, in this book, I tried to collect all the, the ways of acting. I mean, starting something, continuing it, uh, managing to not to be blocked by, by a bad habit or by, uh, um, by your imagination. Now, how to make, um, for example, I'd, I'm talking a lot at the end of the book about imagination, because usually if you're daydreaming in school, uh, well, your teacher writes it on your, <laughs> makes a comment again and says, well, you spend too much time watching the sky, but maybe, maybe you're the next Stephen Hawking and uh, there's more for you in the sky than on the, uh, on the board, you know? So imagination, it's uh, the, the real way to, to find a connection with the world and to start interacting with it and acting. Keith, you are you raise your hand, huh? Okay, um, thank you very much, Olivier. I'm um, Paul Archer. Thank Unmute you, yourself. Olivia. Yeah, thank you. I think I'll be up. I mean, one of the things um, here is the idea that people are sometimes good at uh, the things that they like. But it kind of, I suppose, also works the other way around, doesn't it? Is people tend to like the things that they're good at. You know, because being good at something, being competent, being capable, is something that gets kind of admiration and respect. So it kind of works both ways. But I was also interested in the um, in, in whether there are counterexamples here. Yeah, and there must be some, I suppose, in India. There are, so there are certainly counterexamples of people who love things that they're not good at. You know, <laughs> lots and lots of people play amateur sports and they're rubbish at them, you know, but they love them. And uh, a lot of people paint and write poetry and they're just terrible at it. But, you know, they love it. And, 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 and you know, that's all fine, isn't it, really? And, and, and the other thing, of course, is that there must be some people, I'm kind of struggling to think of some examples of people who are sometimes very good at things they really don't like at all. There's a famous snooker player whose name escapes me in, in Britain who, uh, who maintains that he really doesn't like snooker at all. <laughs> Partly because he's probably had to spend half his life practicing playing snooker, so he's really gone off it now. But uh, he keeps winning tournaments, so he's endlessly complaining about it. So I was just wondering about the counterexamples and, and, and how, how hard we look for those. Well, you, you're so right. Um, I read this uh, study about the, the problems that champions met when they failed. And there was a difference between the champions that were good at something they didn't like. And these guys, when they fail, they end up in a huge depression, you know, because they didn't love the, the time they, they spent working on something they were good at. And, you know, to top it, uh, they failed. So it's a double loss. And uh, on the opposite, the champions who were in love with, uh, with uh, what they were doing, even the, when they failed, it's not that they didn't care, but they survived it pretty easily, you know, because they enjoyed the, the ride, enjoyed the way, they enjoyed every second of it. And when you're talking about uh, not being good at something and enjoying it, that means it's pretty good for you. It's good enough for you. It's just that you're not going to to sell it to anybody else than your own family, you know. Uh, as long as you don't pretend, this is uh, you know, you're talking about situations where there's there's a difference be between people who want to pretend because they want recognition, you know, they want success because they want outside recognition, but they forget about the only criterion that's worth in this life, which is the uh, internal pleasure you have doing something. So if you make a difference between making a living, you know, you have to make some disagreeable things sometimes to, to make a living. And the things you do as a hobby, uh, if you, as a hobby you choose something you don't like, I mean, you're stupid. <laughs> so um, uh, you're right, but I don't think it's a counter examples. But the, the problem, you know what, is the, the kind of, 
if I if I was to rewrite that book a bit, but I'm too lazy to do it, I write another one, you know, a different one. Um, the failure in my book is that I chose only champions, and who cares about champions, you know? Who cares about a guy able to um, to walk on a wire between the twin towers? Well, I care because I'm unable to do it and. Uh, whatever, whatever time I spend uh, trying, I'll never make it. But it's interesting, you know, as a, as an idea. Uh, um, and in today's literature, the how-to literature, uh, we spend too much time on the success, you know, or the successful people. They give you the illusion that it's the only way to succeed. But who cares? You know, uh, if you are happy with your life, that's the main goal, and nobody's going to teach you that in the book. So in my book, if I get rid of the champions, I would keep the, the people who really love what they do. I would keep the love, you know, and get rid of the outside recognition. And if you enjoy something, anyway, the slightest progress is like uh, the highest satisfaction. It's, it's huge, you know, if you can master the red, uh, if you're a painter. Well, some painters say it's the most difficult color. But me, when I was young and I was uh, enjoying the red a lot, without knowing it was difficult for expert painters. So we have to enjoy our inadequacy with the expertise, you know? Thank you very much, Olivier. Now, um, you, mentioned Olivier, the guys, you mentioned the guys, just a minute, Keith. You mentioned the guys that get upset when they lose. Um, we've got women here as well. And so I wonder if they, we've heard from four of us men already, I wonder if any of the women, before we come to you, sorry uh, about that, if any of the women wanted to ask a question because I can't always see the hands. So speak if you're female and you want to make a point or ask a question. I'll count to three. Uh, one, <laughs> two. A lot of pressure, huh? <laughs> I'll tell you what, while Keith is asking his question, if there's anyone um, who isn't male and wants to ask a question, please ask. Enough of this gender stuff, Matt Holland. Um, Keith, what would you like to say? Yeah, thank you, Matt. Uh, Olivier, why I'm particularly interested in your subject is that uh, I'm a keen golfer. And uh, I'm wondering if you've come across this, where um, all the sort of skills and techniques that I've got, I'm told that they're stored in the left-hand side of my brain. But when I'm playing golf... I mustn't focus my attention on those skills because I can only access them from the right-hand side of my brain, which is involved with my five emotions. So what I do now when I'm playing golf, and I find this very effective, is that I say I listen to the birds whilst I'm actually playing the shot, or <laughs> I... I have a sweet in my mouth and I focus on the taste of the of the sweet. And this seems to, you know, help the brain to access the skills for me to play. Uh, did you come across that in your studies at all, Olivier? Well, yes. Uh, for example, with uh, Hélène Grimaud, the piano player. Yeah. Uh, she's talking about the she met um, a very famous uh, musician who explained her things in a way she started thinking about what she was playing. And immediately she, she fell into depression and she was unable to play and uh, um, because she was thinking too much. Yeah. I don't know with what side of the brain, but the, the bad one. You Thinking know? is in the left-hand side of the brain. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in fact, the, you, uh, I came across to the story of Glenn Gould. Do you say Gould? Uh, and he, he found a way uh, to, um, when he met a difficulty in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, how would you call that, partition, in a, part, you know, in a, in a piece, uh, um, he, when he was thinking about it, he couldn't make it. So he was uh, opening the radios and the TV in his, in his hotel room. So he was not able to listen to his own uh, playing. And he discovered that was a pretty efficient way uh, mm -hmm. to solve 
the difficulty, you know. So yeah, yeah, you're right. I th uh, and um, I'm talking about two uh, very, very interesting uh, psych psychoanalysts uh, called François Roustan, who spent a life um, listening to his patients. And uh, at some point, he got tired of it because he said, you know what, people, we spend years trying to understand where the suffering comes from. And once we find it, we keep suffering. Yeah. So he said, maybe we have to find some easier and quicker way. And he, he started uh, using hypnosis. And I'm talking about that because he's, he's it's truly really incredible because he, he said, in, in a way, you don't have to understand what makes you suffer to get rid of it. Yeah. And he's, talk, he's telling the story of this guy he saw only once because the guy came and the guy was in a very deep, bad place. You know, he, he'd been there for years, unable to, to do anything. And the guy sat in a, in a chair in front of Francois Roustan and François Roustan just said, stand up and make a step or take a step. And the guy didn't know why, but he just obeyed and he did it. And then he, he sat back and he was like amazed, you know, that was so easy. And uh, he kept silent Well, he went away and he never came back. And François Roustan said, maybe he was traumatized by the revelation that maybe all of his problems could be solved with just taking one step. Yeah. And that's a difficult, you know, my book is about that. We have the sense of effort that's so much ingrained in ourselves. So it's very difficult to get rid of it, you know? And in, I'm not saying we can get rid of it for everything. For example, of course, if you want to learn a language, you have you have to spend the hours now. But uh, for most of the stuff, uh, maybe we we don't spend our effort well. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Olivia. We're entering our last eight minutes. So uh, again, I'll say anyone who doesn't identify as a man, we, do you have a question? Anyone? Sounds like a football oh, game. Huh? Eight minutes left to score. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyone? I'm looking for hands up. Mm, no. Okay, now it's a free for all. Anyone at all? <laughs> I've got more, but it's unfair. I've got too many. Penalty kicks, one each. <laughs> anyone? Um, Olivier, towards the end of your book, you say uh, this. Uh, not everyone, and you've touched on this, but I just wanted to um, push it a bit further. Not everyone, you tell me, can champion tennis player, free diver, tightrope walker, or pianist. And that's where I wish to bring this book to its close, sitting comfortably in an armchair with Gaston Bachelard, the philosopher of reverie and happy imagination. For anyone, as he explains, can be a champion in their imagination. There is nothing stopping you no competition, no adversaries, no obstacles. In other words, you don't have to dive 100 meters down to be happy. It's enough just to dive into the imaginary. Someone who imagines well will live well and is better preparing themselves for an act of will. Careful though, imagination is not a compensatory or escapist dream. It is an energizing reality. That's what the imagination is. Images are true accelerators of the oh. psyche. They set the mind on fire. When you live out images sincerely, you feel them, you experience them. And you can do that lying on your bed or on a walk or in a train or in a plane. You can do that wherever you like. Yeah, I like Gaston Bachelard a lot, and I'm very happy you you chose that that um, quote uh, because I I believe so firmly in it. I think it's gonna be the subject of my, my next book. You know, the the reality of imagination, and uh, Gaston Bachelard's. Um, you no, know, he used to live in a very noisy place in Paris. Uh, 
pretty close to where, where I live. Uh, it's uh, Boulevard Saint-Germain. There's a lot of cars, a lot of traffic, a lot of noise. And it was um, uh, a guy from the countryside. No? So he needed some silence or some natural sounds to, to rest. And he's telling that story. He said, I couldn't uh, sleep until I decided that was a decision, not a reverie. It was a decision he made. I decided to imagine that the sounds of the cars um, were the sounds of waves, of the ocean. And I fell to sleep, you know? And um, that was a revelation. And then he decided to explore this revelation and he calls it elementary imagination. That means that if you like one element more than the others, for example, the fire, if you enjoy a candle, he says, even if you don't have a, an actual candle, you know, if you're out of candle and it's locked down and you can't go out for a candle, imagine the flame of a candle and the flame of the candle will do its work of rest. And this is amazing, you know? This guy uh, believes so much in the power of uh, uh, po poetic images, not uh, images from Netflix, you know? Not images from movies. I love movies, but he's not talking about these ones. He's talking about the ones you create with your closed eyes or with the words you use, you know? Um, to give you another example, uh, when he's talking about being a champion in imagination, he's not talking about you dreaming of being Andre Agassi and uh, winning a tournament uh, with a, uh, you know, a, a lot of stress. And uh, No, he's not talking about uh, compensation as Freud would, would define dream. Uh, imagination is not an illusion because if you imagine things sincerely, and this is weird, you know, our imagination can be sincere. It means that he takes an example. He says, if, you are, if your heart is broken, imagine that you have, um, uh, how you call that? Uh, I forgot the word, a broom. Imagine that you take a broom and you use it. But he says, if it's a heartache, do it very slowly. You know, because you're going to uh, need some time to get rid of it. And it's weird because it's ridiculous if you think about it. You use an imaginary broom to get rid of your sorrows. What's that? And he says, it, it, exactly. If you think of it like that, it won't work. You have to imagine it for real. You have to feel it. You have, a, as a Keith said, you know, uh, when he's using his imagination, uh, uh, maybe... Uh, the next time you go to golf, uh, there's going to be a lockdown for birds, you know, so maybe you can imagine the sound of birds and that will work. You know? and, and Bachelard tells about that. So at the end of my book, I, I thought, OK, I've, I took only examples from champions and blah, blah, blah. Uh, what about us? We're never going to be champions of anything. And Bachelard says, it's OK if you find the right way to rest. And Francois Roustan said the same thing to his patients. Please, for example, if you're afraid of jumping into a pool, if you're afraid of swimming, don't force yourself into it. Don't spend your time in a swimming pool. Find the right um, position in your, in your um, chair. You know? Find the position where you are completely relaxed. And from that point, when you don't have any goal anymore, then you will be ready to act for real. And that's such a counterintuitive idea, you know, that uh, I needed the whole book to make it kind of understandable. Um, thank you, Olivier. Um, is there anyone else who has a question? Remember, uh, we, we wanted a non-male question if there is one from any of the women present. Uh, going once the pressure's on again <laughs> any once going twice this is a even if you take the french out of the title the contents page provokes you to want to read it with things like um the art of gliding 
stop thinking, chapter seven. Um, chapter eight, hit the target without aiming. And then chapter 10, the power of dreams. Um, it's a great read. Uh, any last questions? Going once, going Seven, twice. Um, oh, I have a question. Hello, oh, I'm six, David's six, wife. Um, 95. I, oh, yeah. Just yeah, six, I just wanted six, to five, ask five, Olivier, yeah. I work in education well, and a lot of what you said this evening um, resonates with how I feel about education at the moment and how it's constantly asking children to strive for something that they don't believe in or something that they well, can't that can be more than um, 5p, engage in. And so I was just wondering what you see the role of education being in the light of what you've been saying about um, about to do with your book, really. Well, it's really difficult to answer your question because I'm a teacher too. I'm a parent and a teacher. Um, and it's very difficult because you have to give a discipline for sure. Yes. But if the discipline is just um, a threat, it doesn't work. So yeah. to me, um, um, the answer is in this quote from Philippe Petit, the wire walker. He says, I believe in the whip if it's the student uh, that holds it. Uh -huh. Not to whip uh, the teacher, of course, not to whip, <laughs> it, whip himself. That doesn't mean that you, you have to go from suffer. Uh, uh, it's okay to suffer if, yeah. if the point is not to suffer. You know, uh, this is why I believe in imagination. Yeah. If you imagine your goal and you love it, you know, uh, for example, me, uh, I was suffering when I was swimming when I was 10 years old because I didn't enjoy the idea of the water. And uh, I had to watch Le Grand Bleu many times, you know, this, this uh, movie that some people find is ridiculous um, by Luc Besson, uh, not an intellectual guy, but me, I was reading so many books. I was living close to the sea and uh, I was hating the beach, you know? So I had to go through the movie and the movie made something into my imagination and that gave me the pleasure of going into the sea. And, and now to me, uh, swimming, skin diving is connected with reading, with writing, um, uh, even fishing is connected with finding the right word because I made an imaginary connection. So if you're a teacher, um, it's very difficult because you are in a position where your teaching is mandatory. Yes. So unless you have students that come freely to you, it's very difficult to give them the pleasure of imagination. But still, it's possible if you make them feel that you are a prisoner too, you know. <laughs> so um, uh, there's no easy answer to your question because I think teaching is not a science. It's an art form and it's much more difficult than being a champion uh, because there are no employees when you succeed, you know. And uh, maybe you are the only one to know it. And maybe when you succeed, your students, they uh, understand it 10 years, 20 years later, you know? Yeah. So um, I don't know how to answer. It's, uh, but what's for sure, um, if, if you think school is just a place where you tell people to pay attention, well, uh, they're gonna pay it some other way. They'll never yeah. understand anything. Thank you. Um, Olivier, um, uh, thank you very much. And thanks for that last question. Um, at the Swindon Philosophical Society, people come voluntarily and yeah. enjoy thinking <laughs> and exploring ideas. Uh, how great that is. Lifelong learners, every one of them. And um, thanks, Philo, for, for um, coming and, and being part of this. Uh, but most of all, um, with his great little book, which is now called The Art of not trying too hard. The adjective French has gone out after, you, after what you said tonight. Um, but seriously, it's full of good things. Um, let's give a Swindon Philosophical Society, Swindon Festival of Literature thank you to Olivier Pouriol. Thank you very much, Olivier. Thank you very much to you all for your attention and, uh, and kind questions. <laughs>